Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Think Big virtual forum on 2050 City Mega Growth, Assessing and Addressing the Impacts. My name is Bridget John, and I'm representing IAIA, your host for the webinar today. IAIA is the International Association for Impact Assessment, and we are the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment to make informed decisions. We're thrilled to have you here today. We hope that you had a chance to look at the two pre-recorded sessions, but if not, don't worry, they're still available online for you, and you'll still get a lot out of this panel. We're grateful to all of the panelists for their recordings, and then for also joining us today on the live session. So before we jump in to why you're all here today, I just want to invite you all to visit our website if you haven't yet at IAIA.org. There are a lot of free resources available to you, including our previous Think Big virtual forum on a cleaner, greener COVID-19 recovery. We have a variety of webinars that are free for everyone on top topics from ESG, resettlement, health, biodiversity, uh, social impact assessment. So please head over there and check it out. And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention our upcoming annual conference at IAIA23 in Kuching, Malaysia, taking place in May. We are very excited to be gathering there together in Malaysia and the registration deadline. It's not too late to join us. April 12th, get your registration in. We also have several online training courses available. In fact, there's two coming up with registration deadlines next week, one on conflict management, one on leadership, and there's some others that are listed there that are upcoming. We're really excited and love our professional development program our PDP. It's, uh, we've gotten great feedback on it because it pairs online training with a one-on-one -on -one mentor. And so that registration will be opening soon for the next session. So check that out. And of course, we have so many free downloadable publications available uh, from the short form to the long form, um, condensed to lots of information. And so please visit our website and check that out. Before we jump into the webinar, just a few bits of housekeeping for you. We are indeed recording this session, and a day or two after this meeting, you will receive a link to the recording so that you can access that as well. And if you have questions, we will be taking those. And feel free, don't wait. If you have questions already or any time throughout, please use the control panel of, for GoToWebinar that you'll see on your screen. And it's either a chat or, or labeled questions. And feel free to type your questions there. We'll see those on the back end and be moderating those and getting those over to our panelists. So, now, for the reason you're all here, I am thrilled to introduce to you our moderator, Heather M. H. Goldstone. She is an award-winning national science journalist with the Woodwell Climate Change Research Center in the United States. And it supports sustaining Earth and human systems in a time of urgency. She founded and hosted Living Lab Radio on Boston Public Radio and also hosted Climatide, a U.S. national public radio blog exploring the impacts of climate change on coastal communities. Her research has been featured on U.S. National Public Radio's Morning Edition, U.S. Public Broadcasting Service NewsHour, The Takeaway, and PRI's the world. So Heather, we're so grateful that you are here to moderate our wonderful panel. And speaking of our panel, I'm going to turn it over to you now and let you uh, get us introduced to all of them. Thank you so much, Bridget. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to be with you. Um, as Bridget mentioned, I currently work with Woodwell Climate Research Center. We are uh, an independent nonprofit organization that is dedicated to seeing the best in climate science integrated into societal decision making across sectors and at all levels. And I think that really aligns with uh, what we're talking about here today. And that's the realization that um, an understanding of environmental impacts must be part of our decision making because the decisions that we make now about where and how uh, we develop 
about how we grow our cities into the future, those decisions right now have not only local and regional ramifications, but global ramifications well into the future. And so I'm thrilled to be here to moderate uh, today's question and answer session. And this really is an opportunity uh, for you to ask your questions of our fabulous panelists. As Bridget mentioned, all of their presentations were pre-recorded. I'm sure many of you have already watched those. If you have not, I, I highly recommend that. Um, but this is your chance to ask your questions and get them answered. So uh, before we, you can at any point um, ask your questions in the questions section. And, and of course, we will be uh, monitoring that. And um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can over the course of roughly the next hour. And so without further ado, um, I want to introduce some of the folks that you'll be hearing from today, starting with um, our two commentators, Ahmed Sanda of the Ashawa Consultancy and chair of IAIA's Climate Change Section's Technical Advisory Group, and also Gary Middle, uh, the Environment Policy Advisor for Western Australian Local, Local Government Association and Director of Vision Environment. And Gary, in addition to serving as commentator, will be helping to um, filter and organize questions today so that we can get to as many as possible. So thank you, Gary, for playing that role. And Ahmed and Gary, I invite you to um, turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones, and uh, share some of your introductory thoughts for today. Ahmed, you first. Hi, Heber. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm speaking to you from Abuja, Nigeria. I'm an impact assessment and uh, systems consultant, as she had said. I also co-chair the, uh, the climate change tech group on, that engages with decision makers and urban planners. As an impact assessment practitioner, I'm looking forward to learning and engaging with everybody here, actually more than anything, and reaching the conversation and seeing the nexus between cities and, and, and climate change. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ahmed. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Gary Middle. I'm coming to you from west coast of Australia, from what our traditional owners call um, uh, Abuja, or what our, um, our traditional owners uh, call the. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Sorry about that. Our um, our, our, our nation. So I'm interested, my background is I'm an environmental planner. Um, I've worked in impact assessment, but also my particular interest is on city planning and how impact assessment um, in, uh, in, is involved in that. I have particular interest in coastal issues and coastal management. And as many of our mega cities are on the coast, I have a, a fascination and interest in seeing how we explore um, adapting to uh, climate change uh, at, at the coastal area as well. So I'm very much looking forward to tonight's uh, panel discussion. Great, thank you so much, Ahmed and Gary. And again, Gary, thank you for uh, your help also behind the scenes with uh, the questions today. And like I said, you can ask questions at any time, go ahead and start putting those into the questions uh, section. And we will get to those in just a few moments um, after we give each of our panelists um, a moment to int introduce themselves. And today's panelists are Peter Nelson, project lead for planninggreenfutures.org, Wes Fisher, co-chair of IAIA's climate change section, Julian Baskin, the Cities Alliance Secretariat, uh, principal urban advisor, Yao Amoye Ase with CEHRT Environmental Consulting Ghana and the former president of IAIA, and Brian e. Walmsley with South African Institute for Environmental Assessment. So uh, Peter, I'll start with you and we'll just work our way through each of our panelists. If you'd like to uh, give us uh, you know, a minute or two of introducing uh, yourself and your work and, and your thoughts on today's uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much, Heather. Very pleased to be joining you all. Uh, I'm a land use planner and an environmental scientist, and I've been very fortunate in my career to spend 20 odd years working in Africa on strategic environmental assessment at a regional or national level, uh, and also to work in a number of other countries and uh, regions of the world at the same time. I found myself in lockdown, uh, wondering what I was going to do since I couldn't get out in the field to do my normal activity. And I found myself asking the question, why are we faced with so many challenges in the world today? 
um, literally from climate change, biodiversity loss, civil rights movement, injustice and inequality. And I ended up trying to write my own assumption and assessment of what I called a global strategic environmental assessment. In that, there is a chapter that deals specifically with cities and the fact that the majority of the world's population is gravitating to urban areas. And this has enormous implications as we're going to explore in this session. So I'm very pleased to be able to join a distinguished panel who actually know more about cities than I do. But anyway, let's see how we go. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Wes, you're next. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Wes Fisher, and I am co-chair of the International Association for Impact Assessment Climate Change section. And uh, the climate change section has uh, has a uh, has a technical advisory committee that Ahmed heads that is looking at. Uh, um, particularly at liaisoning with uh, urban planners and decision makers. And so uh, we ha are very fortunate to have Julian here, and Heather as moderator. Um, I have a background in biology and geology. I've done many trainings, particularly in Africa for non-governmental organizations. Um, my involvement with uh, in the climate change section began back in about 2010 uh, when uh, I, I helped with the organization of two symposia, one in Alberg, Denmark, and another at the World Bank to look at uh, the links between impact assessment, the impact assessment profession, and its value in addressing climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. So um, uh, seeing this come to fruition, this uh, this think, think Big event um, is uh, very dear to me, and uh, I look forward to an interesting exchange uh, questions from, from the audience. Thanks. Well, Julian West teed you up a bit, so I will hand it over to you next uh, to introduce yourself a bit more. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I believe people are spread around the world. Um, my name is Julian Baskin. I graduated in 1986 from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa with a town and regional planning degree. Since then, I've worked in the field of, of city growth and slum upgrading in multiple countries across Africa. And I've worked at a local NGO level, international NGO level, for cities directly, for multilateral organizations, and for universities. So I've come to this situation from multiple perspectives. Essentially, I'm committed to the idea that if we are going to manage the rapid growth of African cities, we need to deal with the number one crisis, and that is the capacity of the cities themselves to cope with urban growth. Thank you. Yeah, I'll turn to you next to introduce yourself and, and your work. Yeah, I believe you're still muted. Sorry, sorry. There we sorry, go. Thanks, Emma. Yes, yes. Yao Ose is my name from Ghana, and um, I started my uh, impact assessment life at the EPA Ghana, um, uh, rising to the position of director. Uh, for the impact assessment at the EPA, and then changing course, um, leaving the EPA to set up my own consulting firm um, to practice. And um, so I have been practicing for a while now, for over 16 years or so, and uh, now almost um, um, getting extinct. Um, my interest is now. My interest is now um how to not only integrate climate change into impact assessment uh, but more so um how to make impact assessment more endearing to policy and decision makers so uh, the possible obstacles in the making uh, impact assessment appealing to decision makers policy makers is what i'm looking at now 
um, so that uh, we can have uh, more resilient and uh, impact assessment system that is embraced by all sectors of society. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, over to you, Bryony. Um, thank you, Heather, and also good day to everybody, whatever time of day it is. Yeah, my name is Bryony Wormsley, and I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. And I have over 40 years experience in environmental and social impact assessment. Um, and I'm currently a board member of IAIA, very honored to be in that position. Um, currently, my work focuses on a lot of institutional um, assessment and strengthening, um, lots of capacity building and training, uh, and then doing quite a lot of research in the development of reference materials, um, manuals, guidelines, and handbooks, and that sort of thing. Um, most, um, all my work is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, it was during one of, doing one of those research and development um, materials that um, I was asked by Cities Alliance to, to really investigate the question, to what extent um, are environmental and social safeguard systems effective in dealing with um, issues relating to climate change and informality in the context of massive infrastructure um, and other development in our urban cities. Um, and so that caused me to, um, to do quite a lot of research on that. Um, and, and really that was the subject of my paper. And hopefully people have, have had a, a watch of that, um, of the, my paper and everybody else's, so that we can have a really good discussion about how do we take um, our environmental and social safeguards forward so that they are actually effective in dealing with, with issues around climate change, informality, um, and massive development. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all uh, again for being here with us today, sharing your time and your expertise. Um, again, to our audience, you can uh, drop questions in the chat at any time. This, this uh, hour, hour and a half really is for you to ask uh, your questions. But as moderator, I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask a couple of my own questions first. And uh, I want to start with something that's really been in the news um, recently, and that is artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. And, uh, you know, we've heard so much uh, thought and discussion about uh, what evolutions in this technology might mean for uh, writing, for learning, for a whole host of fields. And I'm curious to hear from each of you what role you might see AI playing in uh, this, this field of impact assessment and figuring out the long-term and global uh, effects of our decisions. And maybe we'll actually just go in the reverse order that we did uh, introductions. And uh, I'll start with Bryony and we'll work our way uh, back down the, down the line. I would love to hear each of your thoughts on this. Thanks, Heather. I think actually I'm the wrong person to ask, being uh, a bit technically challenged and perhaps somewhat of a dinosaur. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there, there are roles for artificial intelligence, but I haven't got my mind around it yet. I, I still think there is scope. Um, yes, it might be very good, but I still think um, there is room for the human brain as well to, to work out, particularly when we're looking at social issues and social interactions and some of these more complex things. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm probably not very informed on artificial intelligence. I'll hand it to my fellow panelists. Yeah, I think that's a completely fair response at this point. If you're not actually in the field of AI, I think a little bit of um, uh, curiosity and uncertainty is, is very warranted. But I, I wonder, Yao, any thoughts on, on this idea of, of artificial intelligence in, in impact assessment? Yes, just like uh, Brownie. Um, uh, well, let me um, try to, you know, um, offer something. I think that I think, uh, um, artificial intelligence um, can play a role, and uh, there is the potential, um, especially in predicting um, impacts um, and establishing future trends and helping to develop scenarios. Um, um, of what is likely to happen and uh, perhaps give a kind of uh, a lead into 
um, what choices, what options we decide uh, we decide on. Um, but of course, uh, artificial intelligence would also rely uh, a lot on the human ingenuities and ideas uh, that we, we feed into it. So, so in brief, um, I think artificial intelligence has a role, uh, but it will also depend on us, our ingenuities, and what we feed into any, any such system uh, to help us uh, look into the, the future. Thank you. Great perspective. Julian, any, any thoughts on this? Yes, like the other two, this is my weakest topic, to be honest. But <laughs> I think you have to the obvious here that in many African cities, and I'm going to be talking very specifically about African cities, uh, in many African cities, there is a data desert. There's very, very little data, even for normal planning and for regular daily planning. To the extent that we can fill that gap with artificial intelligence and we can and get information from various sources, that's always going to enrich the planning uh, on the continent. Having said that, you also need people to take that information and act on it. And, and just for, for example, if you go to Liberia, there are three regional, town of regional planners in the entire country. Uh, you know, so you really have a question of artificial intelligence, but how do you use it effectively if you don't have the capacities institutionalized at the city level to make use of it? Two really good points. And of course, artificial intelligence can only learn from the information that we give it. If we don't have uh, data and information to feed it, then um, unclear how, how useful or how intelligent it, it might actually be. So I think great points. Uh, Wes, your thoughts. I, uh, I look at artificial intelligence and the way it's, it's uh, uh, likely to affect us in the near term is extremely significant uh, looking at but but more from the uh, management of the biosphere perspective um, in one of my last slides in my presentation is of a termite mound and what I consider an example of emergent phenomenon where the, the, uh, the sum is more than the parts. That goes all the way back to Aristotle. And I think the, the smartphone uh, for us is, is transforming uh, global society very rapidly, but what's coming with AI and with uh, digitized impact assessment at the project level, but also uh, uh, in looking at planetary boundary conditions, um, it's going to it, it's going to be kind of essential to our uh, tran uh, transitioning to a truly um, uh, genuine form of sustainability, where we're sustaining the biosphere, we're preventing uh, further species loss and further loss of biodiversity. We're tackling what's happening to the oceans and uh, what what is going on with emergent technologies. So I really feel that uh, emergence is kind of a part of evolutionary process. It shows up in many disciplines, not just biology, but uh, if, if you think about the history just in the last uh, 100, 200 years, the number of additions to uh, 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 information systems, communication systems, um, I think we're in we're in for uh, 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 hopefully a, a very uh, important use of this technology it can be used to uh, help get us to sustainability. I think a lot of us are afraid of it. Um, but uh, like any new technology, um, it's a balance between just how much it can do for us uh, versus it's being used in ways that, that uh, uh, make things more difficult for society. So that's, that's my take on it. Thanks, Wes. And last but not least, over to you, Peter. Peter, you're muted. Oh, 
And now we've lost your video, Peter. I know we all think that after three plus years of, of living in these virtual spaces, it, it should be uh, smooth and seamless, but it, it never seems to, to be that way. I know I never seem to, to fully learn. All right, Peter, we've got your video back, but we're still not hearing you. And I know your microphone was working just uh, 20 minutes ago, so. Nope, still not hearing you. All right, well, Peter, maybe we'll um, give you a, a, a moment here to, to try to work on the technical issue. I do want to recognize a, um, a, a comment that came in from one of our audience members, uh, Maria, just really resonating and agreeing with um, the caution about AI and uh, the garbage in, garbage out uh, principle and the idea that, especially when we think about uh, city growth uh, in uh, Africa, that we need to be very careful about the idea that the dominant voice and the dominant um, uh, source of, of information and training uh, for AI is still mostly um, white men at, from uh, Western backgrounds and that that uh, does not necessarily serve uh, all, all people and all places um, in the application of those technologies. Peter, I don't know, have you have, have you been able to, to unmute? No, we still can't hear you. So we've got uh, a couple of questions showing up in the question area. Welcome you to keep answer, uh, putting your, your questions in there for our panelists. Um, in the meantime, I have another question and Peter will we'll try to hear from you on, on both points here if we can figure out your microphone. Um, I guess we'll, we'll stick maybe a little bit with this, this tech theme. Um, you know, Elon Musk has said that population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. Um, that was uh, less than a year ago than he said that. And uh, I'm curious, you know, as a little provocation, how that strikes you and maybe as a broader question, what do you see as the greatest challenges that we face as our cities grow, both in terms of, um, physical, biological earth processes, and also in terms of social and political, the decision-making and, and human processes that are, are clearly at least 50% of the equation for the future of, of civilization. Um, Peter, any chance that, that uh, the microphone is, is working? I don't have a lot of other suggestions uh, for you to try. Um, All right, we'll jump to Wes and, and hope that Peter can, can join us soon here. Well, my, uh, my presentation dwelt, uh, put a fairly heavy emphasis on planetary boundary conditions. And uh, as the human population has hit, hit the uh, 8 billion mark, we're, we're now uh, back a few months ago that that uh, we we crossed that threshold uh, the, the 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 various planetary boundary conditions we we already face with with uh, both climate change and 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 uh, changes to the uh, nitrogen phosphorus uh, cycle due to our agricultural practices um biodiversity loss species loss that um we have we have these challenges ahead of us and it's going to be uh, it's going to be a, a not an easy transition to bring our to bring the population down the birth rates are leveling out it looks like um like uh the 8 billion mark hopefully we won't go too much higher than that but even so, um, our our effects, uh, sort of our global fit, footprint, is one where we are uh, we're in fact using uh, within within uh, uh, each each year we exceed the carrying capacity um, for um, maintaining maintaining the planet in a sustainable way. So um, I think. What Elon is saying is uh, we're going to have uh, significant labor shortages 
and um, globally, we're going to have to come to deal with that with an aging population. And there, there are, in fact, in uh, Nature magazine, uh, there's been a, a, a really good paper that uh, looks at, um, this was back in uh, January of this year in Nature, the January 24th issue, uh, looks at this this question of uh, uh, of, of what's what's happening. Um, oh, I, I think I've got the wrong the wrong citation. Um, it is in fact uh, something that came out in Nature, but but not in that time frame on the um, uh, what's happening with aging populations and. Um, Probably the the uh, uh, an example is a is a paper uh, jointly done many many uh, Japanese uh, population specialists as well as folks from uh, Sweden been looking at this at the question of how to deal with um, with this uh, the 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 rapid growth in how much of the world is going to be in the uh, upper age category, 65 and above. And, and so it's going to be, require quite a bit of thought to deal with that. Um, and I think Japan, because of what's happening to the, age, the population there, uh, is, is focusing on this very seriously and looking at what what it, it is termed a depopulation dividend. Um, and, and there are some also interesting papers written about the concept of the depopulation dividend for the Asia Pacific. So um, I, I think Elon has, uh, you know, he's raising an important point, but if we're going to, uh, if we're going to have uh, sustain the biosphere, we're in a we're in we're getting into a pretty desperate situation, um, and and we're going to have to come to grips with this. Right, Peter. It sounds like you think uh, maybe you're you're back on and able to join us. Can well, we hear you? I hope so. It depends. Oh, if you fabulous! Can we can hear you. <laughs> Technical problem in an unusual way with the microphone. Um, I'd I'd like to respond first to the point you've now raised, and then come back to the previous one, if I may. Um, my first comment would be, yes, we are seeing declining population in industrialized parts of the world, but we are seeing very rapid population rise, particularly in Africa. The reality is that we are going to see 2 billion additional mouths to feed on this planet by 2100, and almost all of them will be in Africa. We're going to see the largest expansion in urban areas across Africa. It stands out in all of the statistics quite remarkably. And the globe is simply not in a position to deal with the changes that are coming, partly because of climate change, which is going to affect cities around the world, partly because of biodiversity loss, but far more significantly because of issues to do with food supply, water supply, energy supply to those expanding cities. And frankly, the way that we are tackling the issue at the moment just doesn't begin to, to breach the problems we face. So I'm sorry, on a lot of things I disagree with Elon Musk. And I also disagree with him in relation to artificial intelligence. My strategic assessment basically has a hypothesis. It says that the human species has demonstrated an ability to develop technological solutions to all sorts of critical issues. Our, our advances in medical science, in space exploration are phenomenal, but our basic natural intelligence is totally lacking. As a species, I cannot understand why after 400,000 years of evolution, we are unable to get round a table and prevent wars taking place. At the moment, there are 2 billion people on the planet who are involved in some form of conflict. That's out of 8 billion. That's 25%, a quarter of the world's population are not comfortable, are not secure, and in many cases, they're being killed. How can we talk about artificial intelligence solving those sort of problems 
if we can't actually come together and find solutions. So, yeah, I've got some pretty strong views on AI. I agree with what Wes has said. I agree that if we can use computers, if we can use data collection, if we can really pull it together to inform our environmental impact assessment studies, it will be very valuable. But if we leave it to machines to answer the question, well, I've said enough. Thanks. No, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, really some some profound insights there. Um, Bryony, I saw you you nodding and, and seeming to to kind of respond to what Peter was saying. So um, love to give you a chance to chime in here and whether that's uh, more on the AI or, or around this idea of kind of population, is that the biggest challenge or what is the biggest challenge um, that we face moving forward? Um, yeah, thanks. I, I um, completely agree with, with Peter. The, the comments by Elon Musk were very um, Northern Hemisphere centered. Um, focusing in on, on countries like Japan and Europe and North America, um, where indeed there may be a decline in population, but um, that forgets and ignores the rest of the world, um, where you know, there are, as, as Peter correctly said, huge numbers of people already unemployed, um, and in some cases unemployable, because of the really poor levels of education and so on that we suffer from in Africa. Um, and they're not where the where the jobs are really wanted, and, and this is a real a real problem. Um, so I, I I just was really agreeing with Peter. I can't say it any better than he did. That um, I'm also I don't agree with that statement. And I also like to echo again uh, Wes's statement about planetary boundaries. Uh, whether we're talking about people, or we're talking a number of cattle on a hectare of land. You know the carrying capacity um, once it's succeeded. Um, there is this total degradation of the environment, and we're fast approaching that point where there are too many people on too small a planet. Thanks. Thank you. Yao, I'm curious what your thoughts on this uh, population question are. Yes, thanks. Um, my views, you know, I share I share the views of Brownie, Peter, and Wex. Um, I don't differ much. Um, I, I, I seem to think that uh, there is a rather disproportionate um, 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 energy generation demand use, food production, and um, and 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 overconsumption uh, in the northern, as um, uh, Brownie said, in the northern hemisphere uh, compared to the south. I mean, you, you can see the, 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 the wide dichotomy uh, between, between, you know, the two. And, um, and uh, uh, we cannot just take one, one side of the coin and then base our hypothesis um, on that. Um, I, I believe that perhaps the, greater, the greatest of threats to humanity um, is rather war and conflict. Um, um, we are seeing what is happening, uh, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and we do not know uh, how all this is going to end. And, um, and I think these are more perhaps uh, critical issues for, for, for humanity to deal with. Um, uh, the, the, the rival, you know, um, Cold War days, um, um, and 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 the threat that it's uh, the polarization, one you know one side against the other, and alignments and uh, you know all that. Um, I think that is perhaps um, a, a bigger threat uh, to humanity humanity than um, 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 the idea of population. Um, population collapse and population rise on one side and then you know the other. So that that's my view. That's my view. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julian. Any any last thoughts on this topic? Yes, um, and not too different to the other speakers. Just to say, you know, from where I sit, looking at African cities. We did a very detailed study into 42 cities across Africa 
We looked at it across the multiple dimensions of governance, citizenship, the environment, the economy, services, etc. And if you ask me, what is the elevator speech? How do you sum up thousands and thousands of pages of reports? It's unemployed youth living in slums. And you know, can you imagine what it means to the future um, of this planet? If you, if the biggest issue is unemployment, and, you, and it's no relief because you're living in slums and no water, no electricity. Uh, and what does it mean for your future? And if youth don't have a sense of a future, I hardly see they're going to have a sense of climate change and other international priorities. So to me, the biggest problem facing the world today is unemployed youth. Mm. All right. Well, okay, from, from one big grand challenge to another, um, Maria has asked, what about water and sanitation in uh, the widest sense? How are cities and megacities um, to, to cope and supply these fundamental uh, services? And, and I'll maybe leave this one open um, to, to whomever would, would like to, to jump in and, and take that one on. Well, Heather, if I may just make one observation. Um, when I set out to try and do my analysis of global issues, I found that almost everything I needed had already been written by somebody. And when I realized that we were going to be talking in this panel today, and knowing that I have a lot of gaps in my own knowledge, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll do a bit of surfing. And the thing that has struck me is how many organizations worldwide are looking at this challenge of mega cities. Each one is looking from its own perspective. Some are looking at it from health, some are looking at it from food supply, some are looking at energy, some are looking at water. And there's a great deal of analysis out there that's already been done. Um, and I think the questioner is absolutely right that water scarcity is in fact going to be one of the major challenges for mega cities. There is no alternative but to develop the infrastructure, uh, to develop the reservoirs, to develop desalination or whatever source of water you're talking about. And as each of the urban areas expands, the challenges of servicing that become higher and higher. Um, and I'm going to make a plug at this early stage in the session for something that Bryony wrote about in her paper talking about strategic environmental assessment, because I think Perhaps the one thing that we as environmental practitioners can bring to this is the capacity to synthesize. And I think um, we just heard from Julian talking about the problem of education and unemployment. And I absolutely agree that those are fundamental challenges, but so too are all the other components of, of growing a city. So we need to find some way of coordinating and bringing together this vast amount of information enormous enthusiasm. I'm, I find myself always listening to Wes, who is a great optimist. Um, Wes, you know, in his own paper, discusses the number of organizations who are trying to find solutions to problems. I, I remain the, you know, the miserable old pessimist in all of this, not convinced that we'll actually pull it all together. But um, I, to Maria, I, I would agree that the water challenge is a fundamental one. And we need the technicians, but we also need the planners and we need the environmental assessors in that mix. Thank you. Wes, yes, and then if anyone else wants to jump in on the water question. Um, well, I wanted to return to what Julian was saying. And uh, UN Habitat is uh, sort of the place where uh, there's a close look at youth in um, informal settlements and slums, and we have we have probably around uh, 700 million youth living in a situation with um, um, where water and sanitation is not adequate, where health care is not adequate, where education is not adequate, where uh, Employment is uh, is uh, uh, you know, we're very 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 limited, and if you look at that and and look at those figures, that's equivalent to maybe something close to 18 Canadas, two Americas, 10 UKs, 5.5 Japan's. 
So that's an enormous problem. And when it comes to dealing with climate change and planetary boundaries, if you don't tackle that, it will come to it will it will become a, a problem that you know it's what Peter is saying to us. Can can we in fact turn things around at this stage? Um, I I think you, you can't worship technology because uh, you know it, we we have uh, Malthus predicted what was going to happen and technology turned things around the industrial revolution. Um, artificial intelligence can play a significant part, but we got to, we've got, if we don't, uh, join together as a, as a, uh, as a species and figure this thing out, nature is going to figure it out for us. Uh, and we may make a terrible mistake with our weaponry. Um, you know, we, we're, we really are running, we're running up against a, a time limit, but it's still possible to turn it around. And there are lots of great things happening. Yeah. Yes. Yes, to just add um, a little to this. Um, I think um, water scarcity, water and sanitation are really uh, major challenges that we we have especially in 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 our countries uh, in africa ghana for instance um we have these um, um flood situations um we are experiencing the effects of climate change um rainfall episodes um um are uh, somebody will say just giant one and uh, you know flash floods happens and uh, we have a large area flooded especially in uh, in our cities accra you know um now the question is can we take advantage um can we take advantage of these uh, these situations um um can we uh, conserve this water um during the rainy season when you know we everywhere is in floods inundation is common lives are lost and uh, you know a very miserable situation how can we take advantage and capture a lot of this rainwater because there are situations after soon after the rainy season then um everywhere dries up and you cannot have um any water even for you know, sub uh, urban uh, agriculture. And so I believe the challenges also offer opportunities that we can take advantage of, conserve water, um, um, uh, and, and then also with respect to sanitation, waste, human waste, and, and the like. I mean, we can we can convert a lot of this into bioenergy uh, through biodigesters and, and that kind of thing. And uh, once um, this become a resource, then we would see that the negative effects um, would just disappear. So, so I believe that um, we, we, we must confront the challenges with options for taking advantage of the situation um, and 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 that will be a, a big a big a big help for 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 our cities our major cities and impact assessment i think can lend a hand in this direction thank you julian or brian anything you'd like to uh to add i will note that we um yeah our time is, is quickly ticking away. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, so. Yeah, uh, just to make the point that we really need to shift the focus away from mega cities to the secondary cities. We really have to start seeing the secondary cities where the biggest opportunities are because many of them are yet to be built. So we can put in place the type of planning and infrastructure required going forward. Whereas in the mega cities, you're always going to try and scramble the eggs. 
So I think a lot of the solution lies in, in focusing on the secondary cities to get a better hierarchy uh, of cities in, in, most, in most places. The other point just to make is that water really has three components to it. It's how you manage the supply of water in the city, and, and many cities have 50% of the water leaking into the earth. The second, uh, the second aspect, of course, is flooding. We need to protect the natural systems to ensure that flooding doesn't happen in the same way. But the third, and perhaps the most dangerous of all, is food security because of drought in the hinterlands of these cities. Uh, because we know that once there's a drought in the rural areas, immediately famine starts to happen and food insecurity in those cities. So water is the critical thing you need to, to unblock all around. Brian, any last uh, thoughts on water? Not on water, but a lot to say on energy. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I'll, I'll go to a, another question from um, an audience member from Peter, who um, says he works a lot on local climate action uh, where he lives in Ottawa. And he posed the question, what's your view on working as locally as possible um, to address climate challenges? Uh, that, of course, is coming from uh, a perspective, a location where, you know, I think in the um, in the northern hemisphere, there's there's been this idea of, of a lot of local or individual action, which assumes a lot of local and individual resources and capacity. And so I'd love to get this panel's thought on the relative responsibilities of local, national, international um, as cities of all sizes and mega cities as cities grow and are confronting this myriad really of, of intertwined challenges that we've been talking about of uh, water, both scarcity and too much, uh, shifting population, uh, you know, just a, a whole host of different challenges. Who bears the responsibility and, and how do we find that right balance of local, national, international of different players um, to address these challenges. I don't, I don't want to hug or uh, hog the, uh, the, the sort of introduction to these issues, but I, I attended um, the, the 30th birthday party of a company that I worked with who focused very much on issues within the UK. And they had a very interesting debate about how you develop green infrastructure within um, a, a European city, how you try to focus on living conditions within 15 minutes of where you are, the concept of a 15 minute city where you can walk to your uh, hospital, you can walk to your school, you can walk to your place of employment. Um, a lot of focus on these sorts of issues. And it struck me listening to that, that if I was in Kinshasa, where the population spends nearly all day walking, looking for a job, um, that's a very different set of environmental conditions. So I think if you look across the world, we're, we're all dealing with the same problem, but we've all focused in at different levels. Um, I like what uh, Julian had to say about thinking about secondary cities. Because it seems to me, although we're talking about the population of the world moving increasingly into urban areas, we are in danger of forgetting that food resources have to come from somewhere, water has to come from somewhere, and it's how we manage the rural urban interface that's going to be critical. So I, I think people can be involved at every single level. Um, perhaps the one area where we're really not achieving the success we need is at the level of the United Nations. That, that's not to say it hasn't got all the right ideas. It just doesn't have the commitment behind it that it needs. Sorry, can I say something about this? You know, I think there's far more climate action happening at a very local level than one, one would believe, because one thinks that the climate agenda is driven from the top down. In point of fact, climate action is driven by necessity. People realize that their cities are flooding, they realize they're losing their economies, and they have to do something. So in, in, in just about every slum that I work in, or every informal settlement I work in, people are talking about what they need to do about the drainages, how they're going to have to move people off the river banks to make sure that the river can play a better role in taking the, the excess water away. So my answer to you is that localized action is happening. What's not happening is the agreements needed to really give it support and to build on that action 
and to really build it up to scale from, from the international policy perspective. Ryan, yeah, I, I saw you nodding at the question and you raised your hand there, jump, jump in. Yeah, I agree entirely with Julian. Um, yeah, I've been, I do a lot of work in rural areas in Africa and you don't have to tell people about climate change. I mean, they are absolutely, utterly and completely aware of it because it's happening to their day-to-day -day lives and they are having to make adaptations as they go. I think people who, who don't know about climate change are those and pretty much as Julian said at the, the sort of policy and planning level, who, who still don't get it. Um, I'm still seeing engineering designs based on the last 50, 100 years worth of data without any conception of what it's like, what will it be like going forward based on the new normal. Um, so I, th I think there's, you know, the people who should know <laughs> perhaps don't. And the rural people are very much aware of what climate change is and how it is affecting them. So I think we, we, again, how we each adapt to it um, depends entirely on the situation um, and, and, yeah, and each person's commitment to, to whatever they've got to do. Yeah. Great. So I want to um, move to yeah. another question, uh, kind of an, an interesting uh, twist for us all to think about. Um, and the question was, you know, we often think about impact assessment as negative impacts, um, what, if anything, is being done to undertake positive impact assessment to uh, get a better handle or quantify the effects of regenerative agriculture or um, other, you know, these, these climate solutions, I guess, these, these positive actions that we're taking, how do we incorporate that into an impact assessment framework? Ryan, go ahead. Um, that, yeah, very good question. We do tend to focus on the negative, um, but in all our laws say that we should be looking at the positive and the negative effects of a development. Um, the problem here, what, what happens is that usually the negative impacts of a project are those that can be managed usually by the developer himself, be it a mine, a road construction contractor, or whoever it is. The negative impacts tend to be within their ambit of control. Whereas the positive impacts usually require someone else to make them happen, whether it's, um, you know, there's going to be greater access to markets. Well, somebody's got built, you know, you, you develop an irrigation project, so, but you need access to markets. So the benefit doesn't happen until the access happens and that somebody else has to do that. So, or there'll be greater access to education. Well, if you haven't got a bridge over the river for the kids to get to the nearest school, then it doesn't happen. So a lot of the benefits um, tend to need commitments from either government, often government, or third parties to, to realize them. And, and often you, know, you hear developers um, will say, well, yeah, improving access, improving hospitals and so on in schools, that's not my business. I'm here to build the road, um, whatever. So I think the difficulty is to realize the the positive benefits, we call them development projects, it's supposed to be for improving quality of life. And often the benefits are not felt by, by the, those people who are most affected. The benefits are experienced by somebody perhaps far away. Um, so the, the people, you know, the people feel the negative impacts and they don't get the benefits either, are the people who are most directly affected. So I think there's a problem there in, in the whole roll out and implementation of environmental management plans where the 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 person or the people responsible for making sure that benefits are enhanced that they know how to do it and have the money to do it and that usually comes back down to things like political will and other other agendas yeah Yes, just to just to add to uh, Brownie's uh, points. Um, sometimes um, you have projects that are are mitigating projects themselves. The projects are meant to solve problems. See, and um, even there, even there, though are they are they they supposed to be mitigation actions um, on the whole as a project. Uh, they could still have the uh, they could still have the negative effects. Okay, so um, 
when we come across such a project, we still have to look at it uh, from the impact assessment perspective and look at how to, you know, even enhance, enhance the mitigation options that the project is meant to achieve and also to identify the negative effects that could inadvertently arise. Thank you. Peter, go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I think that uh, this is again one of the areas where if we distinguish between impact assessment, which is focusing on a specific infrastructure project on the one hand, and a strategic assessment that is looking at the policies, plans and programs, this is where there is a very real opportunity to look for the positives. And I think it was Yao at the beginning of our discussion who talked about alternatives and scenarios. And in my experience, um, when you put in front of people choices um, which point to different futures, it can stimulate very successful discussion. And the policymakers who take part in that become very aware that their constituents may have a different view to them. They may have started off thinking, well, the answer to this problem is actually better transport. But if the discussion gets round to the issue of education and jobs, then that becomes very much higher up on the agenda. So I think if we can be more creative in the way we use impact assessment, not just to focus on what will be negative about this, but how can we develop our plans so that we gain a win-win across the sectors? Um, that, that's again, I mean, you'll hear from me all the time. It's my plug. I actually believe passionately that a strategic assessment can open up um, all sorts of opportunities that people are, are unaware of. And I think the city environment, the urban environment, um, you know, is, is an excellent place to do that because we've already mentioned a lot of the interest and enthusiasm comes from communities themselves. And if they're given the opportunity to say, this is what we want for the future, uh, that, that, that opens up a lot of positive elements. Thanks. A couple of things that I want to say about uh, positive impacts. Um, an impact assessment professional, uh, just like a, uh, a medical professional, uh, is looking at how to minimize harm or, or really do no harm. And um, when it comes to the actual assessment, it's the, it's the mitigation plan that ends up being the most important component. How, how are, what are the alternative strategies that people can look at and mull over and finally focus down on and prioritize? So it's, the, it's, it's not the impact assessment itself, it's what the strategic environmental assessment ends up laying out as potential alternatives for action. Um, and it, it applies to the, the, the impact assessment process. It's what all of us as practitioners are, it's the reason we're trying to get um, a broader public aware of the value of this process um, and, uh, and, and to try and reach out to Many different, uh, many different organizations and institutions and the general public to get these processes, the processes applied. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, looking at, at uh, positive impacts, you do, you do want that, that's your outcome, but it's, it's how you get there, what the strategies are for getting there. So I want to turn to what will probably be our last question from the audience, just keeping an eye on time here. And this comes from Joseph, who, um, by the way, Yao says, uh, hello, an old friend who uh, hasn't connected in a while. But his question is um, around how we come together to address the many issues we've been talking about. And he says, IAIA is exploring and taking on these important conversations, which is necessary and wonderful, but IAIA is not alone. So how can IAIA connect with other organizations and experts such as UN Habitat, the World Urban Forum, the New Urban Agenda, Sustainable Development, the list goes on and on. Um, how and where does, does impact assessment play a role 
um, and how do we ensure that we are working together in a synergistic way, not duplicating efforts or reinventing the wheel. So maybe um, Yao and Wes, I will invite you to, to answer from kind of an IAIA perspective and then get the rest of our um, uh, panelists to jump in uh, with their thoughts on, on how do we connect and make sure that we're um, working together in a way that's uh, synergistic. Okay, thanks, uh, Heather. Um, um, let me start from, you know, the, the, the perhaps the earlier uh, question or issue you raised about the relative responsibilities, um, local, mm -hmm. national, international. And um, um, from there, um, I, I, well, starting from the local, um, uh, of course, Brownie uh, alluded to the fact that um, the local people um, see climate change effects and they know it, they know it. Um, now the, 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 the challenges, the, the, the survival, the, the survival needs of people um, can compel them to um, certain actions and behaviors uh, that may give impression that uh, they are perhaps not aware of um, climate change and uh, and the negative effects of what the action will lead to. See, so, so this is what I see to be the biggest challenge: survival. Um, when we have we have cases here in Ghana where uh, illegal mining, gold mining, has become such a monster that um, no government uh, appears to have an antidote to it. Um, uh, you can find gold everywhere in Ghana. <laughs> so the people tend to mine gold even under the streets, under people's homes and everywhere. They know the effects. They know they are not supposed to do that. Um, now, I believe that um, national initiative uh, towards you know, appealing um, adaptations is what we must pursue um, at the national level the application of impact assessment must be appealing and must be um, um, and this is what i said from the beginning uh, as my interest how to make impact assessment endearing to policy makers decision makers so that they all embrace it okay and so then it can be applied um, not selectively, but you know, wholesale. And uh, this is what would help, um, will help give us results. If the international, what the international um, bodies can help is to uh, complement what a national system is and um, the national institutions that are supposed to uh, champion um, impact assessment, uh, support to them to be on their feet, the World Bank, for instance, instead of setting up their own you know, review mechanisms in, in the country, could work with the national institution um, and so that collectively the capacity is built and the, you know, the system becomes attractive and effective. And I believe that's the one way to ensure that we, we get results. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. West, do you want to chime in on on how uh, IAIA in particular can connect, and, and how in general we work more synergistically? I I would take a step back. Um, after World War II, there was a uh, there was a uh, a coming together that involved primarily financial people from around the world, who set up the World Bank system and set up the IMF. If you look at, at who was involved, they were primarily uh, white males. Um, what I think we are facing is a situation where we have to have either major reform in the current institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, or we need, a, we need an initiative on that scale to address the kinds of things Julian's talking about. If you have 700 million, unemployed youth 
you need uh, some sort of institutional change at a global level. And, and, and Peter's talked about, the, you know, what can the UN play, truly play that role? So far, we, we don't see the UN uh, able to function effectively to deal with that question. Um, so we have we have this question of huge numbers of unemployed youth around the world, um, and we have a biosphere that where we we we're not looking at planetary boundary conditions with the kind of scientific rigor, rigor we knew to we need to have. It's kind of piecemeal. It's getting it it is amazing what's happening. Our ability to track now what's happening to species loss and biodiversity, but we don't have an institution that does this in a way that fits into strong sustainability criteria. Now I look at Europe and the Green Deal, and I see much promise in the Green Deal, uh, strong sustainability criteria for banks and for corporations, if it's truly strong and is tied to what's happening to the biosphere. But we need to make, uh, I believe, a major institutional investment, in, in particularly in uh, the 700 million young people out there whose lives are uh, uh, have very little hope. Um, so it's time. It's it's time. And I think I think there are uh, billionaires who know this. Um, and it, but we're not getting the message. The message is not getting out quickly enough. Julian, Bryony, or Peter, um, any thoughts on how we connect and work together more effectively? Uh, just, just a, a thought. It might not be directly relevant to this particular question, but it's somehow associated with it. You know, there are organizations around the world and they all get involved in developing toolkits. And then they go down to the local level and they say, here's a toolkit, implement the toolkit. So if you're, if you're a manager, if you're a city manager trying to deal with a city and you have almost no staffing, you really don't know what to do with these toolkits. They're not useful at all. Uh, because it really is, at the end of the day, less about toolkits and more about developing local capacity. So I would rather all the international organizations came together and worked out a strategy. How do we build the capacity at the city level to take on what they need to take on? And just to give you a sense of how, how, how bad the situation is, is that not only have you got to deal with youth and unemployment and climate change and every other issue under the sun, but they literally have 75% too few people to do the work that is required. And I ask you, you know, what mayor of Paris or New York or any city you name would deliver what they deliver with 75% of their staff not there? Good point, Bryony. You know, I'm going to take up Peter, Peter Nelson's um, bandwagon here. And, and, it's the punt for strategic environmental assessment um, again. Um, I think the value of strategic environmental assessment, particularly when we're talking of how do we harness all these different people and institutions and so on, you can do it through strategic environmental assessment, with less so at a project level EIA, um, because you can be, you know, the whole point of strategic environmental assessment is to be working with people from national government down through to local government to local community organizations and getting buying buy into whatever vision or scenario you're creating and i think that is extremely powerful um, it is in now it's growing in the number of, of national legal systems but it is only as a, a sort of listed as a as a you know they should do strategic environmental assessment policies plans and programs with very few um, guidelines or regulations around the actual use of it. So there's a real gap there. The other sort of area that this could be employed is through the development finance institutions, the World Banks, the African Development Banks, people like that. And again, they have 
they do require strategic environmental assessment, but it's very seldom implemented for a num whole number of reasons, which I won't go into now. Um, but we must remember that there are a significant number of projects in Africa being funded by, by big funding agencies who have no environmental and social safeguard systems at all. And they rely on the local system to do the job for them. And you're in an urban area with 75 people too few, or 75% of your people too few, you are just not getting the level of, of safeguards and systems that, that should be there. So they're there in theory, but the actual implementation is really difficult, and particularly um, in, in certain circumstances. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I, I wanna um, just say we're, we're uh, rapidly uh, closing in on the end of our time together. I wanna make sure that we do leave time for Ahmed's uh, closing comments. And so I'm gonna ask each of, uh, of you to, to think about just one minute, one closing thought that you'd like to leave everyone with. What is the the takeaway or call to action that, that you hope everyone comes away from this session with? And um, I'll give every, uh, each of our panelists just a second to think about that. And in the meantime, invite um, everyone in the audience, maybe you can use the, uh, the question uh, panel at this point, actually, if you have thoughts on how IAIA can better connect and um, how we can work together more effectively um, to address the challenges of city growth, then uh, drop those ideas in the question sections. We would love to hear your thoughts on that question as well. So uh, just quick closing comments from each of you. And Peter, I'll start with you. <coughs> Thank you, Heather. It's actually my closing comment would be a follow up on uh, Brian's observations. If we look at the sustainable development goals promoted by the United Nations, uh, the latest report, 2022, is a pretty damning reading. And it's very clear that the UN and many other organizations are looking for the tools that will allow us to try and deal with some of these challenges. I think strategic assessment can do that. It's not an expensive process, even though we often say it is. You need three or four experts working at a city region pulling together the enormous amount of energy that is already being committed across all sectors. Uh, I'm just so impressed by how much activity is actually happening, but we lack the coordination. Everybody's working in a silo. Put it into a strategic assessment, point the way forward, and IAA has an absolute key role to play. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yao. Your, your final thoughts for our group today. Yes, um, um, just to follow up from uh, Peter, um, I, I believe that the, the, uh, every city, every city, um, if it's old, <laughs> existing, uh, must be subject to um, some kind of environmental and social audit and must have an environmental management system um, that would help manage um, the city. If it's new, then of course, it has to go through the motions, as we know. And, um, and it's very important for the countries that have the, the environmental assessment system uh, stand alone under the EPA. Ghana has a unique challenge. And the challenge is that some of the sister institutions think that it is EPA's law, and therefore they are not obliged to comply. And therefore, my suggestion is that the Environmental Assessment and Environmental Protection Act should be a national act, a national act that obliges every institution to comply with, rather than what we currently have. It's a big challenge that we have, making, not making things work as expected. Thank you. Thank you. Julian, I'll turn to you next. Yes, I tend to agree with Byroni on this one. Um, now I think in, in the case of Uganda, for example, we were working on the safeguards of an expressway that was going through the largest informal settlement there. And the question was, where were you going to remove people to? And it became apparent that there were at least 14 other major investments taking place in the city, each housed in a different ministry, and no one had come together to say, how do these 14 different projects impact on the city itself? 
And so it becomes obvious then that we need to have a unifying process, one process which used to be the city plan, but that becomes a city organ, a city thing. This needs to be one that incorporates all the infrastructure investments that will take place to make sure they're working together to restructure the city. Because every project planned individually and assessed individually doesn't add up to the potential of restructuring the city if it's done properly and strategically as it could be done if a proper SEA was done. Just a closing comment, thanks. Thanks so much, Bryony, and then we'll go over to Wes for the, the final. Yeah, thanks. Um, in my view, we've we've kind of got the laws, they're all there, um, and policies, but we're just totally lacking implementation. I think that's, for me, the biggest problem. And when you do a root cause of that, it, it usually comes down to political will um, as, the, as the root cause. For us not doing it um, and that's really the bottom bottom line so you know we we can talk amongst ourselves and everything else but unless this message is getting through to the politicians um, particularly around the whole fact of sustainability of the threats of climate change um, we, we're just not getting anywhere very fast so from my from my perspective it's all down to getting somehow getting that message more ingrained into our politicians to be thinking longer than their five term term election periods and thinking long term to try and get some proper proper perspective on where we're going thank you thank you so much wes um i would come back to uh, sort of what julian is saying um let's say that in fact we can mobilize uh, globally with more effective mechanisms than we currently have uh, through UN institutions. Let's say we can do that. Implementation at the local level then becomes essential. Suppose you have the funding, suppose you have the funding um, and you're trying to deal with, with uh, what's happening with, with uh, uh, 700 million youth in, uh, in in these informal settlements and slum conditions, and you're trying to deal with uh, planetary boundary conditions, um, you still the money is not enough. It's it's how you how you implement the this locally. Um, for me, uh, str strategic environmental assessment is the route to looking at long-term cumulative effects. I look at the European Union and the Green Deal as a potential model for us globally. Um, if you can have strong sustainability, true strong sustainability criteria that are linked to the biosphere and biosphere conditions, that is a huge investment. Um, if we don't do it, nature is going to correct things. Nature will step in and correct the situation um, or some terrible mistake on the part of our species. So that um, I remain an optimist because I see what's happening with technology. Um, uh, if anybody's interested in quantum computing, go, go to Google's site and type in Google Santa Barbara, and that will introduce you to sort of where Google's heading. But we've just seen Bing come on the scene, Microsoft Bing come on the scene with something uh, very interesting. It, it's, it's both very exciting and also worrisome. So um, anyway, that, I, that, enough. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you uh, to each of you for sharing your time and expertise. It's um, been wonderful uh, getting to know your work through your presentations and through the, the question and answer session today. So I really appreciate that. I want to thank our audience today for your fabulous questions. And I know we didn't get through all of them um, uh, with, uh, you know, it, an hour and a half seems like a long time until you're in it and you have all of these wonderful questions and it flies right by. But I do want to hand it over um, to our final speaker of the day, uh, to Ahmed Sanda for his closing thoughts. Um, and, uh, and thank you all again.
Where do we lose Hello. Amit? Thank you so much, Heather. Yes, I have, can you hear me? We can hear you. We cannot see you at the moment. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> uh, we, can, okay. we can hear okay. you. I'll just speak. I'm using my phone. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the fantastic moderation. Um, topic, topically speaking, I would like to say that each and every point made by all the experts, we can see that the, the sum total actually plays out to why the Earth should, why the Earth Overshoot report this year says that we would we would have depleted all of the renewable resources that the Earth ability to be able to regenerate by July, right? And uh, doing this, the gaps in all these can be filled up by AI. Specifically, if you look at the country by country report, where if you live in Qatar, you would have depleted the renewable resources by February 10th, and if you live in Jamaica, it would be December 20th. In the country where I come from, which is Nigeria, there is no data, and there's about 43 other countries with no data. This, this, these are gaps where AI can actually help fill up. So thank you so much for, your, for the fascinating discussions, and the discussions were quite enriching, and I'm, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to take things back with us, and that if we call each and every one of you back, you come back here and, and enrich our understanding about these um, topics. Thank you so much. And on behalf of AIA, IAIA, the board, the new CEO, the president and, C and the CEO, I say thank you again. Ahmed out. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you everyone for your presentations. Uh, let me just uh, bring the, that list back so that you have it and you can see the names of all of our presenters today. Um, we are so pleased to have had you um, share your time and expertise with us. Now, we do want to invite you all to uh, check out the next section of this Think Big theme form. And we will be having more pre-recorded sessions and another live Q&A panel coming out in July. So stay tuned, more is coming on this great topic. We also have some more webinars coming this, uh, the second half of this year on human rights and digital impact assessment, food security assessment, and more. We work in, in the final stages of getting those uh, ready to be launched and, and getting those timings ready, uh, working with our moderators. So lots of great content ahead. So with that, I do want to thank you again and echo Heather's comments. Thank you for all of you to participate. And again, to Heather and to our panelists and Ahmed and Gary for working um, uh, behind the scenes as well. In a day or two, you will receive a link to the recording that you can of this session. And so you can rewatch. And also, when you leave, please note you will be receiving a brief survey. We encourage you to fill that out. That is very helpful for us. And please continue the discussion with us. Uh, feel free to use our hashtag or our Twitter handle um, to share comments that you heard or your own thoughts about this topic uh, with your colleagues and your networks. We appreciate that and we would love to continue to hear from you. So we know that your time is very valuable. We hope that you found this to be valuable to you as well. Thanks so much for participating. We'll see you next time.